Last week, we talked about the fruit of the Spirit. How did it go living out the fruit of the Spirit this last week? Were you loving and patient and joyful, peaceful and kind to everybody? Of course, right? Because it's going to be easy after we hear a message on it. Well, maybe not. Today's passage contains some practical examples of the fruit of the Spirit in action. And so how do we take the message we learned, and maybe you have had some victories, maybe you've had some failures, but how do you keep moving forward and moving what we're learning about the fruit of the Spirit into our relationships and into our life? Well, Paul hits um, some very practical matters here, taking the fruit of the Spirit straight into our relationships with one another. He gives us a vision for the Christian community where the fruit of the Spirit is our practice. It's what we're known for. It's what we're marked by. Have you ever gone to a church that you could say that definitely they live um, according to the fruit of the Spirit in the way they talk about each other, in the way that they treat each other? Well, that's the vision that we have for the body of Christ, for the church. We, the church, are the heavenly family of God. We are children of God the Father, adopted into his kingdom. Jesus Christ is our shepherd king. We're indwelled by the Holy Spirit individually as well as altogether corporately. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're the fellowship of the redeemed, sinners, dedicated to building one another up in love who have now been transformed into saints. Um, The vision God has for his church is great, and maybe it's greater than ours. The Galatian church had lost its vision for the fellowship. As we learned in the very last verse of chapter 5, Paul admonishes them and says, let us not become conceited. Oh, they were being prideful. Provoking one another, they were picking fights, envying one another. They were in competition with each other. Paul now recasts the vision for this messed up group of believers. He begins by addressing them, and I love this, not as screw-ups, not as jerks or, or fools, but he says, brothers, brothers. That's in contrast to their prideful, contentious behavior. Imagine Paul just stepping in and saying, brothers. He affectionately regards them as his siblings, brothers and sisters. He warmly admonishes them with love from this point on. And so that word, Brothers, changes the tone. Now, the first thing we're going to see is that we restore our brothers and sisters when they're caught in sin instead of attacking them. In verse 1, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Now, to be caught in sin is to be overtaken by surprise. This is somebody that becomes aware of their wrongdoing. Maybe they were kind of aware of it as they were entering it, but they've committed the sin, and now they're looking at themselves saying, how did I get here? What happened to me? How could I do this thing? They're caught off guard. They're shocked. And perhaps even the church community is now shocked as they discover their brother or sister in sin. And that is always the question, what are we going to do now that we're in sin? Or what are we going to do as believers now that we know our brother or sister is in sin? Now, I find this interesting that the word caught is in the um, passive the passive voice, that it's happening to the person. So um, there is this main subject. There's a main actor that's um, surprising them. And the assumption from what's being 
spoken of here is transgression itself is personified as an adversary that sneaks up and attacks. And so it's the transgression that caught them off guard. Or sin. It's been laying in wait. And then it springs upon you when you least expect it. Maybe when you think, I can't sin in that way. But it also, transgression as the adversary, also lashes out at anybody that comes to try and help. You ever see those videos, and there's a lot of them these days, of somebody being attacked, like in a city or in a subway, and then people are just kind of standing around watching, and you watch the video, and you're like, why don't you jump in there? Because they're afraid of getting attacked. But we're thinking somebody do something to help. Transgression is an enemy that's out there attacking our brothers and sisters, but we're called to have courage and step up and help out. So who should do something when a brother or sister sins? Well, it says here, those who are spiritual. Those who are spiritual. Isn't it funny that a lot of times people that think they're spiritual are the ones that attack instead of helping. They're the ones that are like, hey, did you hear what happened to so-and-so? And And like in Proverbs where it says the words of gossip are like choice morsels that go down deep inside, you know, and for some reason we find it really appealing to talk about people in sin rather than doing something about it. Those who are spiritual are those that are indwelt by the Holy Spirit and producing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, especially love. So there should be in a congregation a lot of spiritual people, um, those who have matured in their faith, those that are growing in their faith and are in relationship with the Father. Paul um, speaks of this spiritual person in verse 16 of chapter 5, where he says to walk in the Spirit. If you're walking in the Spirit, or in verse 18, we're led by the Spirit. Or in verse 25, we live by the Spirit and keep in step with the Spirit. If you're keeping in step with the Spirit and you hear of somebody in sin, your heart immediately thinks, I want to help them. So what is their goal in getting involved in the first place? Well, it's all about restoration. It's not about punishment. It's not about shame. It's about restoration. And I find it interesting, this word to restore means to repair, to restore to its former condition. It's conceived of as replacing a part or putting together what was torn or broken. And and we find it in ancient Greek manuscripts in medical writings to refer to setting a fractured bone. Um, It's restored, put back in place, which would be a very painful process, of course, and then wrapped back up so that it can heal correctly. In the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, we find this word used to describe the fishermen mending their nets uh, that have been perhaps torn, dragging them in and out of the boat, or putting their nets back in order. Um, And so our goal, when we step into a situation where somebody has been caught in sin, is to restore, to heal, to put back in place. So our goal is healing, not destruction. It's forgiveness, not condemnation. And so we join with the Spirit in this ministry of restoration. And what do we restore? Well, we want to see people restored personally in their relationship with God. And so it's about helping them get right with the Lord. And then we got to help them get right with the body, you know, help them get right in the fellowship to help them become fully functioning again. And maybe like what Jesus did with Peter after Peter denied him three times, Jesus reinstated him three times. Do you love me, Peter? 
yes, I love you, Lord. And, and he said, feed my sheep. He gave him a ministry to do. And so whether it be our, both our personal walk and our fellowship, we need to help people get restored in those areas. Uh, restoration, though, cannot occur without some sort of confrontation. And this is where it can be tough. There were some years ago where I was playing indoor soccer. And I played soccer my whole life. And then when I got old, I started playing indoor soccer, thinking it was easier. But, you know, in some ways, it should be easier. But as an older guy, it was just way too hard. So anyway, I, I um, ended up going up for a header and coming down on the ground and rolling my ankle, at which my foot totally moved out of place. And then my bone, tibia, hit the, hit the ground. And, you know, if you've ever played indoor, it's just thin little uh, carpet on top of concrete. So you know how forgiving it is. Um, so I, I thought, well, you know, I've sprained my ankle before. Um, I've learned. You just got to walk it off. You know, you just got to walk it off. So I spent a week walking it off and limping and not, nothing's changing. And suddenly my foot turned bright red like a sunburn and was burning. And I'm like, okay, something's not right here. So I go to the doctor to find out I have um, cellulitis, an infection inside my foot. He goes, man, this could kill you. <laughs> um, so we had to deal with the cellulitis, gave me an extremely painful shot where the sun doesn't shine. And... <laughs> had to deal with the broken bone, had to deal with the broken bone, you know? And so we got to deal with the sin and sometimes it's not comfortable and we think we might be able to limp along. Oh yeah, I, I know my brother's sinned, but we'll just kind of ignore it for a little while. Or I know I'm in sin, but I'm just going to ignore it for a little while. But somebody has to say something and encourage and restore in Proverbs 27, verse 5, if you're afraid of doing this, here's a great word for you. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Unfortunately, um, we want to be the good guy, and we think that means being super nice and just saying things um, that are positive. Um, but what we need to do is bring up the broken bone. But when we do it, we do it, it says here, with a spirit of gentleness. Gentleness. Remember that word? We learned it last week. It's one of the fruit of the spirit. And so Paul, again, he's applying the fruit of the spirit to our relationships with one another. And he says, do it with a spirit of gentleness which means strength under control. You know, you don't set a bone with weak, limpy movements. You have to be precise and exact. Or if you're resetting a, a dislocated soul, shoulder, you know, it's a tough deal, but you got to have strength and you got to be precise. We're to help one another with gentleness, strength under control, motivated by love, done with humility, with sensitivity and not harshness, not with leniency towards the sin, but gentleness towards the sinner. You see, we don't wink at sin and we don't say, oh, it's, you know, it's not that bad or whatever. No, sin is sin. It can mess you up. Sin brings death. But as we do it, let there be no hint of judgment or self-righteousness. Jesus says this in Luke 6, 36, be merciful, even as your father is merciful. So when we're merciful, we're like our heavenly father. Judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. will put into your lap for with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. When I mess up, I want somebody to be there with gentleness and love and help me out. Um, 
I want them to be merciful. And I'm sure you're all in that same boat. If, if you want mercy running over, then give mercy. And if you're like me, I need a lot of mercy. I mean, just for my wife, I need a lot of mercy. <laughs> and she's very merciful. Praise the Lord. Be merciful and receive mercy. But we also talk about sin and confront sin with having gone through ourselves personal self-examination. In, in Matthew 7, 3, it says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? I imagine people in the crowd when Jesus was preaching started laughing. This is a funny picture of trying to pull a little speck out of somebody's eye, but whacking them across the head because you got a log sticking out of your own. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And so instead of being so finely attuned to everybody else's problems, um, be more concerned first and foremost about being right with God yourself, then you'll be spiritual and then you'll be able to restore. Now, as I talked about before, transgression is the aggressor here and will lash out at anybody trying to help. And so Paul says, keep watch. Keep watch on yourselves when you step into those situations because they're gonna, the, the transgression itself will turn its anger towards you. So you need to be vigilant. Be on the lookout. Be careful. Remember what the Lord warned Cain in Genesis 4, 7. He says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Again, sin is the aggressor here. Crouching at the door, waiting to pounce. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Do not enter these situations where you're helping out somebody in sin without being aware of the dangers involved. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stand take heed, lest he fall. We need to be praying, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. When that's our daily prayer, we're constantly aware that we are susceptible to any sin. Don't be caught off guard. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Maybe you've been thinking here this morning, man, I am so messed up. Nobody struggles with what I'm struggling with. Wrong. <laughs> God is faithful though, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And so our first encouragement from Paul in living out the fruit of the Spirit is when somebody sins, how are we going to respond? In gentleness, in love, in restoration. The second thing we see here in verse 2 is the exhortation to become a burden bearer for one another. A burden bearer. Bear one another's burdens, it says, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The word for burden here is very specific. It literally is a heavy weight that someone's required to carry over a long distance. It is burdensome. Figuratively, it's any oppressive ordeal or hardship that's difficult for somebody to bear on their own. Remember when Jesus had been flogged and mistreated, and then they put on him the cross to carry to his own execution. He was burdened with that cross, and to the point that somebody was called to help him carry it. And yeah, he's God in the flesh, and he could have pulled out his power and done that, but in his humanity, he was weak and 
His body was beat up. And so in Mark 15, 21, and they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. Jesus had a burden that was physically too heavy to bear. And so here comes Simon. There may be a time in life when, like Christ, you have a burden, and it's a physical one, that is too heavy to bear and you need some help. It's okay to need some help. And here's the thing, if you think, I don't need anybody's help ever, then you're saying you're stronger than Jesus. You know, and so we need to realize, we, we need to be humble. We need to know when we, we, we need help. Burdens come in many different sizes and shapes. Could be the result of sin, like the transgressor we just read about in verse 1, but it could also be physical, some illness, financial. You're experiencing poverty, you're in need. And a beautiful thing in, in this body I've seen over the years, people take care of each other. Chopping wood and providing it for those who need it to stay warm, you know. Bringing groceries to their homes and, and providing in that way. Paying for a mortgage when somebody lost a job. Financial burden, that's just too much. Or relational burden or emotional burden or mental burden. You know, these are all things that can overtake us at any point in time. No Christian is exempt from burdens. But what a wonderful encouragement to remember that in God's family, we're called to help each other carry burdens. It should be more sure and certain and encouraging than health insurance. It should be more sure and encouraging Incertain than life insurance or car insurance or anything that we have the assurance of God's people. That's a vision for what the church could be. Unfortunately, you know, sometimes it's just become more of something that is like a product that's sold, you know. Come to our church. We got the coolest music and the greatest coffee, which I believe we do, by the way. <laughs> but really, you know, what, what is it about? There's so much more uh, to the vision God has for his people. You many uh, hospitals were started because Christians were take caring, taking care of the sick when nobody else would. Well, this is a command, actually. It's not a suggestion, it's a command. Uh, this is in the imperative mood. Bear one another's burdens, it's a command. And if you step in and, and bear somebody's burden, it, it's not always pleasant. Not always pleasant, it, it's sometimes difficult. You know, some people have helped me move over the years and whenever we pick up something super heavy, you know, um, Everybody starts to groan. Got to be careful, you know, don't want to throw your back out. But when, when you get moving and, you know, you're walking into the door and somebody pushes on the couch and your hand hits the doorway, you know what I'm talking about? Oh man, it's not always pleasant, but it's good. You know, it's important. Burden bearing is not an option for us. There was one time when I was a youth pastor, we had hiked three miles from our campground out to the ocean on the Washington coast. And, you know, the funny thing about uh, middle school kids is they can get really big, you know, almost like adult size, but they still have little kid hearts, you know. And so uh, that was the case with this one kid. He was out there swimming in the ocean and he um, uh, messed up his knee, sprained his knee. And so he couldn't walk back. And so here's this kid, you know, who I had to put on my back and carry him back to the campground because there's no other way. There's no 
bike. There's no car. There's nothing to pick him up with and take him in there. And we weren't going to call a helicopter or anything. So it was me and one of the female leaders that took turns carrying this guy on our back. Man, burden bearing is important. It's painful, (laughs) but it's good. Hopefully that kid remembers. Well, Jesus condemns the behaviors of the religious leaders of his day because they were not into burden bearing. In Luke eleven forty six, and he said, woe to you lawyers also for you load people with burdens hard to bear and you yourselves do not touch the burden with one of your fingers. You know, what a horrible thing to be in the body of Christ and everybody to have an opinion about your life and not to help you out. Well, Jesus is the ultimate burden bearer. If you want to know and have an example of a burden bearer, he took our sin upon himself. But even right now and today, he continues to bear our burdens. In 1 Peter 5, 6, humble yourselves, therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. You know, when we have a burden that is too heavy, we start with casting our cares upon Christ. And he helps us and he strengthens us, but he also has a body on earth, his hands and feet, which is us, that he calls to step into the situation. And so burden bearing takes love, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Are you willing to invest in helping one another out? Well, if you do, you fulfill the law of Christ, it says. Well, what is the law of Christ? Well, it's summarized in Galatians 5.14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And in John 13.34, Jesus gave a new command which sounds like the old one, but it's new in a certain way. It says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And so it sounds the same because it's love one another, but it's new in that Jesus says, now as I have loved you. Well, how did he love us? He laid down his life. He sacrificed himself. He died on the cross. In the same heart, we love one another now. Well, in verse three, it goes on, for if anyone thinks that he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Some of us really don't like being vulnerable around others because we've experienced prideful people taking advantage of our vulnerability. When we share that we have a need, they exploit your weakness. Or perhaps they lift up their, their nose <laughs> and look down on you. Well, sometimes there are those that think there's something. And Paul speaks to them now. If you think you're so great and don't need to be helped ever, think again. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Beware. You might find yourself with the same burden. It's a deception to think that we're above something or to think that we are something, that we're too important, that we're not like other men or women. I don't struggle with those sins, you know? But what does Paul say? When he is actually nothing. When we fail to see ourselves with God's perspective. You know, there's one instance in the New Testament we're told that somebody is nothing. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, it says, If I speak in the tongue of men and angels, but have not love, 
I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have pathetic or prophetic powers, sorry, <laughs> and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have fa- all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. And so what is the one sure situation we can find ourselves as being as good as nothing is when we have not love. And so we're being encouraged towards humility and love. Bear one another's burdens. But lastly, in verses four and five, faithfully carry the load God entrusted to you. It says, but let each one test his own work and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. This is pointing us, this this last point is pointing us to a, a coming day of reckoning. One day we will give an answer to our Lord for how we lived on this earth. We have an appointment at the judgment seat of Christ that cannot be canceled. You can't delete it from your eye calendar. You can't call in sick. This appointment is set um, and it's unavoidable. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And so in light of this accountability, um, Paul begins by saying, test yourselves. You know, every day look and see if you're walking in the Spirit, if you're right with the Lord, if you're producing the fruit of the Spirit, if you're you're living in love, because that's what really is going to matter. And so we examine ourselves carefully. How do we test ourselves? Well, one of the best tools to test yourselves is with the scripture. James calls the scripture or compares it to a mirror, like a mirror. When you read the word, one of the things you should experience is it reflects back at you what you need to clean up or get right, you know? Every morning, hopefully, you stand before a mirror or something like it and get the chance to fix your hair and make sure you don't got anything in your nose and you brush your teeth and and you make yourself presentable. Um, that's what a mirror is for. And the word of God is like that for us. But some of us spiritually are walking around like teenagers with no hygiene who have never been taught about deodorant or toothpaste. <laughs> Because we don't spend time in the word, you know. So we test ourselves. We read the word. And I want to encourage you when, the read, when you read the word. And here's one of the, the great tests, if you're really doing this well, is if, like you're reading the book of Proverbs. And when you're reading through it and it says, the fool despises wisdom or whatever it is, um, does your mind always think of other people? Oh yeah, man, that's my coworker, big time. Well, if you are, then you're not letting the word be a mirror because I often find I'm the fool and God's revealing to me things I need to change. So the word of God does that. We look at the list of the fruit of the Spirit or or the description of love in 1 Corinthians 13 and we compare ourselves to that. How am I doing with patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control? Or we can spend time in prayer and say, Lord, show me. In Psalm 139, verse 23, David prays this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I find it's best if I do this every day, just like taking a shower, you know, every day. So we test ourselves 
And we do not rely upon comparing ourselves with others. And here's where we can really fall short. If, if we start comparing ourselves to the world and we're like, well, I'm not that bad. I've never killed anybody. Well, good for you, you know? Really proud of you. Um, we're not to compare ourselves with the world. And, and we definitely don't compare ourselves with one another because inevitably our thought is, you know, well, uh, I know more than that person, you know? So we're accountable for our own actions before the Lord. We're, we're not going to be answering for, you know, how each other has done. Maybe we'll be answering for if, whether we helped other people, but we're not going to be answering for, well, I was a little bit better than Dallas with the way that I did this or that. Um, where Dallas would be like, yeah, way better than Dale on this is. At least I changed my oil. That's what he's thinking. <laughs> Take care of my car. Well, the Christian Standard Bible um, translates verse 4 this way. Uh, Let each person examine his own work, and then he can take pride in himself alone and not compare himself with someone else. Um, and I love that encouragement, that we are to compare ourselves with the Word and God's holiness, and that's it. So in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. So verse 5 brings us to the last thought here for today. For each one will have to bear his own load. Now we just talked about burden bearing and helping one another out. And you might be like, well, wait a second here. I thought we were supposed to help each other with our burdens. Well, the word here for load is different than the word for burden. That word for burden is that heavy weight that is oppressive that we might need help with. But this word for load is more specific to the individual. It's the quantity for transport used um, for what's put on a ship for cargo. It's used for a soldier's knapsack or a pilgrim's backpack. And so it emphasizes the individual size of the burden. And, and so God has allotted to each one of us something to carry um, that we're responsible for. You can't carry my pack and I cannot carry yours. That's the situation we find ourselves in here. It's our personal responsibility before the Lord that one day we will answer for Nobody else. We will answer for our own faithfulness or failures. In 1 Corinthians 4, 5, uh, Paul says this, Therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. How'd you carry your pack, soldier? Or how'd you carry that backpack, pilgrim? Well done. You did what I gave you, and you've arrived with it intact. You know, that'll be that day. And so as we help carry one another's burdens, we also help one another learn to carry their own load. If you've ever helped somebody out, or if there's any counselors in the room, you know how important it is to help people take ownership of the issues in their life. Uh, you can't have them always relying on you for every situation they face. They need to learn how to walk on their own and entrust in the Lord on their own. We don't want to enable irresponsibility. We don't want to, um, you know, set those bad habits in stone. Rather, we help people rely on God. So we do carry burdens that become too heavy, like Simon of Cyrene helping Jesus. But we also faithfully carry the pack the Lord gave us to carry. 
And so as we end this passage today, remember, Paul is putting these things in practice, the fruit of the Spirit, and he's giving us a vision for the fellowship and what it could be. It's supposed to be so much richer than I think what we've allowed our minds to imagine when it comes to church and one another. So maybe today, God's encouraging you to restore a brother or sister who's caught in sin. And maybe they're not here today. And you know they're hurting and you know they need somebody to step into their lives and bring God's mercy. Is there somebody God's calling you to reach out to today? Or maybe to become a burden bearer. You see somebody that is in need and maybe it's financial, maybe it's Mental, emotional, maybe it's physical. And God's saying, you know what? I want you to step in and help. I want you to be my hands and my feet today. Or lastly, maybe God is showing you an area that you have been entrusted with something and it is your responsibility and instead of shirking it off or blaming somebody else, he's, he's telling you, you know what? Son, step up. Daughter, step up. It's time to be a man. <laughs> it's time to be a woman and be faithful. Well, these are all encouraging thoughts today. And we're going to continue on with this application of the fruit of the Spirit next week. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your patience with us, with your patience with your church. But Lord, we we don't long to be in that place where we're always um, needing your patience because we're not being faithful. Lord, we pray for something greater than that. We pray for your body to be alive and filled with your spirit and overflowing with love, making an impact on lives in a way that this world steps back and says, whoa. Where the enemy says, that is now my target because they're too effective. Lord, I pray that you would help us to stand in these last days for you. And we give ourselves to you now and pray in Jesus' name, amen.